can feel free to just type. I'm sorry. Um, no problem. Type uh, questions in the chat or or um, raise your hand. Um, I should say that this project it, it's really a very long arc here, kind of really starting in um, 2010 when I was thinking about uh, dissertation projects all the way to now. So it kind of there's a lot of data and things in here too, a lot of personal things that have happened which really inform um, my work and some decisions that I have um, that I have made and. Um, so there's a bit of a story along here um, too. Um, so it's an academic presentation, but it's very much so kind of a storyteller too. Um, so the outline for today, at least it's the way that I think about that arc is a bit about background and history, just the sociological kind of history, but also some, again, personal things that have um, impacted the work. I tend to try to think about the work in three um, phases. One was the dissertation phase, which I, to be clear, I'm not a midwife. I will never be a midwife. I have all of the love and respect for them, not what I'm going to do. Um, but what's important about the phase one is that I did not know any, um, any black midwives. And so that informed um, the sample size to some um, degree in the first phase. Um, but the third phase is far more robust just because so many years have passed and are much more integrated into the work. So phase two is essentially obviously what's happened between ending that until 2020 when I um, got the contract for the book and started doing um, updated interviews. So a bit of a, of a story for now, I'll focus on the two people um, on the far left and the, the person in the middle. The far left is um, Barbara Katz Rothman. She's a um, sociologist at the CUNY Graduate Center where I got my doctorate. I was a um, middle school and uh, high school language arts teacher before I moved to New York City to get my doctorate um, in Baltimore City and then eventually in Washington, D.C. And I had originally intended to look at um, Black maternal literacy practices and how they were impacting um, particularly the Black boys in my classroom. Not about literacy rates, but what Black women in particular were reading, what they had around the house, how that influenced um, what kids like to read. That was the intention. I didn't love the sociology of education literature when I got more um, more in depth into researching and really not that different than um, a lot of public health literature and sociology, frankly, um, thinking about blackness as a deficit model in relationship to education. And I had no interest in that. So I started thinking about black motherhood more generally. And I was really lucky that um, Barbara was there. there the, the sociological literature around midwifery is pretty, pretty slim. And there's a lot of social science, but sociological is pretty slim. And she'd been very, very active in MANA in the 1960s and 1970s, and really did some kind of powerful groundbreaking work on the midwifery model. And so um, I told her what I was interested in. I said, I, I'm a little confused about how many Black midwives there are, very ahistorical. This was around 2010. And at the time, there were two to 3% of what was reported um, of black midwives. And I wanted to know why and what was happening in their education programs and professional associations. So then in 2010, she went to the MANA conference, the Midwives Alliance of North America. And she uh, had a post-it, or not a post-it, a postcard with my uh, dissertation details and she gave it to uh, Shafia Monroe, who is the, the woman in the middle, who I call Mama Shafia. And um, I made contact with her maybe a week after the conference. She asked me to come out to fly to Portland to visit with her. I went a week later to visit with her. And she gave me kind of the landscape of midwifery in the country. She introduced me to the history of Black midwifery. Um, and she is so significant for so, so, so many reasons. Um, but the main reason at the time is that she really had the pulse of Black midwifery because she um, was the founder of the International Center for Traditional Childbearing. 
And so I really owe her in terms of the sample and people who I've made contact with. But one thing that is important and is interesting is that she wouldn't um, sort of give me access to people unless I made the commitment to stay in community. And that is a, a really important lesson for academics and for, uh, for funders, which is a, another kind of key piece here. Um, and she and I have remained incredibly close. And this is a picture of us um, in May when she organized the uh, Black Midwifery Conference. It's the first one that she organized um, since ICTC ended in 2018. Um, and the woman on the right is Mary Lawler, who's the founding executive director of um, NACPM. And Mary is responsible for me getting on the board of NACPM. And that is a piece that we will, um, that I'll come back to. This is my cute little nephew. I just like to show pictures of him because he's so cute. Um, so the history of uh, Black Midwifery, to, to be clear, I am not the uh, historian. I, there is a amazing historian, uh, sociologist Alicia Bonaparte um, at Pitzer, but obviously I know the history, so I'll give just a, a little bit here. The history of Black midwifery in the United States, of course, far extends beyond slavery, and that is usually the introduction in which we think about Black midwifery, um, but it ex it's important to think about midwifery beyond um, death and trauma and tragedy. It is a deeply ancestral, spiritual, communal practice. Um, but there is a way, obviously, that obstetrics has completely co-opted um, midwifery. And that is just a story of patriarchy and racism and sexism just in general. But the specific impact on Black midwifery is really um, significant. I would say a couple of things. One is about um, obstetrics relationship to blackness and just the, the black body in general. We've seen certainly since uh, George Floyd's death, far more attention to, uh, most people did not know who Anarcha, Lucy and Betsy, um, Betsy were. Um, it's unfortunate that it took that to raise the national consciousness around it, but there's also been a lot of amazing, amazing scholarship around how um, early OBs experimented on black bodies for power and profit. And that also in, in many ways relates to the relationship to black midwives practicing at the time in um, the South primarily, um, because they were viewed as a necessary evil and competition and did and said all kinds of horrible things um, to take away their practice, which I'll share some of those historical things. Delegitimizing Black pain, that's important, not only for medical implications for today, but also just socially, how we think about Blackness and pain. And again, that's not just as um, people who are receiving medical care, but also how we think about pain metaphorically, emotionally or otherwise, of Black people through institutions, including um, midwifery, which we tend to romanticize, but we shouldn't do that. It really is a bit of a microcosm of the United States. Um, so the mid 19th to early 20th centuries, the learning midwifery skills from Black, Indigenous, and European immigrant midwives and learning is in quotations because we know that that was essentially a mass story of uh, co-opting midwifery skills, which extends today. They are surgeons, and that's super important um, to remember, and treating all births as high risk is really the problem. Um, so the racist, sexist, and classist peer public smear campaigns, I'll share some of the things. Uh, things I have highlighted in um, red are what I think are most um, important. Generally, I'm just not going to try to read at you, but these are some examples of um, things that started to appear in medical and public health journals in the early 20th century, which really the intention was around um, obstetrics being a relatively low demand specialty in medicine. And so this was a nice combination of uh, power and profit melding. So you have to come up with some kind of larger narrative here. So a lot of it was about midwives being dirty, ignorant, and totally unfit. And talking about public sphere campaigns, obviously not about social media, which we would think about um, today, but in medical literature and so on, um, had a huge impact on how we think about midwives today, especially those of color. 
um, dark, dirty, ignorant, untrained, incompetent, lots and lots of language around evil and must be uh, controlled. We must save our women. There's lots and lots of references to our, which obviously is about um, whiteness at the time. Um, this I also find fascinating. The midwife is a relic of barbarism, a drag on the progress of the science and art of obstetrics, which is really some important, the emphasis on progress. And the progress is about viewing midwives as necessary evils, um, while also kind of going back to that piece about Black bodies, using Black people for teaching material, some of whom were actually um, midwives themselves. Um, and that she perverted obstetrics from obtaining any standing at all among the science of medicine. Um, a kind of big theme here, which we know is the conflation of midwifery and nursing. And those things really started to emerge during the Shepherd Counter Act. Um, this is a super quick um, timeline. 1900 midwives attending 50% of all births. And that's directly related to the rise of um, obstetrics. We know even that's ahistorical. Um, the Flexner report looking at medical education also has received a lot of national attention in the last several years. Very important. Um, it's the same story with Black OBs in particular. They are very few of the overall workforce. And um, I, I am definitely one of those people who believe strongly that we need more, um, more OBs, not to attend to all births, but because court concordant care matters, which I'll um, make the argument. So we need uh, diversification specifically of black people and midwifery and um, obstetrics. The Shepherd Towner Act of 1921 is really the big story in US midwifery. It's the first time when um, it's like the credentialing and licensing of midwives started to happen, but it's such a story of race and class. Um, it's the introduction of largely white public health nurses coming to the South for midwife club meetings to at the time address things like tuberculosis and so on, which were absolutely issues, but the issues are a reflection of the US failing to invest in basic, basic social determinants of health, which is no different than what we are seeing today. But instead of addressing those things, clean water, clean air, and so on, the, the kind of method was to um, pathologize um, midwives and specifically black midwives. The distinction between nursing and midwifery really begins here, and it is really the start of the racial divide in um, midwifery. So we know that um, midwifery in general is overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly white, um, and people still conflate nursing and midwifery, and this largely comes from the Shepherd Counter Act. That was big. Also, the Hill-Burton Act, which um, gave federal funding for more um, hospitals in the South. And so what that did kind of culturally is if you exclude people, Black people from um, institutions like education institutions and hospitals, viewing them as a sign of progress and safety and modernity, it, there's some, been some great work on what happened there that people did want to go into the hospitals because it was viewed as better and safer. And those are totally, totally social, cultural things. Um, uh, just a fun fact that I think is interesting is that when I was doing this research, um, I'm, my mother was alive at the time and I told her I was interested in midwifery. And this was uh, probably about 2010. And she said, um, oh, midwifery, that's for white people. Like, no, it's not for white people, but it really does speak to what's happened generationally. And ironically, her mother was a, um, a midwife. The, the impact culturally on what happened is very, very, very strong. And some of that is starting to shift also because of COVID. Um, by the 1950, granny midwives attended 10% of all births, primarily in the South. Um, and that was truthfully kind of the leftovers that um, obstetrics didn't totally grasp. But by the 1970s, most of that was gone. 
Um, the revival of midwifery is what people think about most recently. There, when I ask my students about midwives, they will give me stuff about like, oh, well, it's a, a white lady with the Birkenstocks and the long hair. That is all cultural imagery, which is, I mean, I, I get it why they have come up with that. Um, but midwifery also is responsible for perpetuating that idea. Um, it really was a very whitewashed view of midwifery. And um, it's not that different than what's happened with the feminist movement, the home birth movement, the women's health movement. There's a way in which the experiences and perspectives of black and indigenous and people of color were not reflected in those movements. And there has been a major reckoning around this revival. And I, um, I kind of entered into midwifery at the time of that reckoning. Um, so today we estimate five to 6% of black people are um, midwives. Part of the big issue here in full transparency is that we do not in this country have for a lot of reasons clear data on the midwifery workforce. And that is a major area for philanthropy. I mean, it should be for the United States government, but philanthropy to really step in and contribute to. We really need to understand the workforce in order to make the gains that we need to make. So a lot of this is estimates in full um, full transparency. But we do know, we have some things. We know that for CPMs, they are zero black program director, but there is one um, black owned and accredited midwifery school, uh, Jenny Joseph's in um, Florida, which is significant to my story, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and of CNM, zero black program directors and 75% of the 38 programs have all white faculty. That has huge, huge implications for who is not only entering into midwifery, but um, completing midwifery education and staying within the profession. Um, I, I will not spend so much time on background data, but I just want to be super clear to really hit, uh, hit the point here is that the percentage of um, all people kind of birthing in uh, the hospital and with physicians is very, very strong. That number has held, although COVID has really shifted some of this, which is really nice to see in a lot of ways. Um, but within the Black community, that has stayed pretty strong, a uh, physician-attended hospital birth. That isn't just about um, things that are happening socially. A lot of that is about legislation and policy and access and insurance, which is another area where funders have a huge, huge, huge role um, to play here. The problem, again, with, with treating all births as high risk is the impacts. This is kind of a direct thing. Um, I do not spend a whole lot of time around why midwives are so important for mortality. Again, we spend so much time talking about midwifery in relationship to death but midwifery for black people in particular, but midwifery is much bigger than that. It is the full range of sexual reproductive health care. It is about person-centered, respectful care. And so there are some direct evidence base for more midwives with these um, data points, obviously around infant mortality, but it's not just infant mortality, maternal mortality, it's preterm birth weight, low birth weight, very low birth weight, VBACs, climate change, huge, huge, so, so, so significant, um, and infertility, which we don't talk enough um, about. Um, the other piece here in relationship to Blackness, because I will speak specifically about anti-Black racism, um, is, again, there's been more attention to this about toxic stress and allostasis and allostatic load, that much like I was saying when I started entering into uh, my doctoral program and thinking a little bit about what I wanted to do. It is not, not that um, Black people just show up with this deficit model and struggle in systems, in education systems. It's just that it disproportionately, consistently harms. And it looks very similar to um, birth. It is the institutional, personal, mediated, internalized. And I'm always fascinated by the studies that look at um, cortisol levels and ways in which uh, stress reduction hormones are so racially divided. Um, and those things aren't just about birth, they're in every aspect of, of life. 
And um, so I'm always kind of interested in how this piece has been sort of a continuity over the years of kind of the three, um, sort of three phases. So the kind of work to do is to address these, the issues of structural racism in every single aspect. Um, in my work, it, the, even from internalized racism, because we cannot romanticize black midwives either, there's so much work um, to be doing at each particular level. Um, I wanna also support uh, the work coming out of um, the Birthplace Lab at the University of British Columbia. I collaborate with them. This work is so significant. When I was entering into this, we really just didn't have this kind of remarkable, robust data. And so this also is why the role of philanthropy is important because we don't, years ago, we didn't have this kind of stuff, but we have more than enough evidence-based, quantitative and qualitative to make some really important points to insurers, legislation and policy and so on. We know there's a direct correlation between the integration of midwives in the healthcare system and not only better physiologic, but experiential birth outcomes. Excellent, excellent, excellent across the board. Again, we can't romanticize that, but the data sort of speaks for itself. And I just wanna really continue to encourage philanthropy to use the so much data out there. It's so, so, so robust in a really exciting way. And the last is um, I'm really interested around um, profits and cesarean uh, delivery, this kind of data we also really didn't have um, before. Um, and that also kind of makes the point, particularly for legislators and policymakers around how significant um, the role of profit and capitalism is in the, the medical model. So leading up to my central argument is the significance of concordant care. We do not have the data around concordant care in the WIFRI. This is also an area where funders play a huge point. There's the workforce analysis that it's required, but also just as um, has been done with physicians about how significant it is when black people are cared for by black providers, that big study that came out in um, 2021 where this data um, is from, this, the same thing will happen with midwifery. It's just that that work is needed. Um, there's so much work and opportunity to be done to do some kind of national collaborating coalition around um, data gathering and mining to be able to articulate the point in an evidence-based way about why it's so important for people to be cared for by people that um, not just look by them, look like them, but share uh, cultural values. And the same thing is not just for race, but it is also for uh, gender and sexuality, um, a point that I will continue to make here too. Um, and the same out of the birthplace lab is the work on giving voice to mothers and things like privacy, dignity, dignity and respect, those things drastically increase when black people are cared for by black care providers. All of that really matters. So the central argument that I make in my book and sort of throughout is that we don't need more people in the medical model. We need greater access to um, black midwives, not just any black midwives though, uh, black midwives who share the same values, who are justice oriented. That is very, very key. We run the danger of um, essentializing people. Um, currently we estimate about five to 6% but the US is not, the black midwifery is nothing more than a microcosm, is my argument, of structural anti black racism and cis heteropatriarchy, which we do not discuss enough, um, which I did not discuss in the first phase, which is very important. Um, and that it fails to recruit, retain, and support the leadership of black people. There have been great gains that have been made, but that stronghold still um, continues. So, key things from the first phase here. Um, this is a point that I just like to make in terms, just in terms of size, the, the kind of animation of it is less interesting, but it's kind of what's most significant in every aspect when midwifery bills, CPM bills come through the states, the first people that they uh, consult are state ACOG affiliates. There's so much work to be done about 
um, even just culturally, people understanding that midwives should be the experts on scope of practice within all bills. It's sort of actually really kind of ridiculous to um, to only primarily consult with um, ACOG, but also the closer that midwives are to medicine, the greater autonomy and scope of practice that they have. So I am on the board for um, NACPM, and there's a reason for that in terms of how NACPM has shown up in the equity um, space really, really early on. Um, these organizations, uh, which I will shout them out, Black Midwives Alliance, they are wonderful, um, Black Mamas Matter, the National Association to Advance Black Birth, which is the evolution of ICTC, the Queer and Trans Midwives Association, whom I work with nationally, this sort of bubble here has grown exponentially as it should. And there are there's more resources to be funneled because they are really doing such significant work. Um, ironic that I am on the board of NACPM and saying this, but in some ways actually even more significant in terms of relevance, um, at least amongst how black midwives perceive them in every single aspect education, legislation, and policy, and so on. Um, so really investing in those organizations, and ACPM too, but really investing in those organizations is crucial, crucial, crucial. Um, so the methodology here, as I said, um, with uh, when I met uh, Mama Shafi, I didn't really know a lot of midwives. It was really a, quite a feat to get 22 of them um, when I finished in 2013. Um, now there's about 43, I have a few more interviews um, to do, but the shift in sample size is largely just because of how um, involved that I have gotten, but I just want to make sure that sort of people know it's a, it's a pretty significant difference in terms of sample size. There were kind of four key themes from the first phase, which shifted um, over time. Again, I'm not going to go through oh, so many of them, but um, internal divisions around who is doing real um, midwifery and what it means to be a real midwife was very, very big at the time, which it really bothered me because there were so few um, Black midwives and it's such an opportunity for them to coalesce. And I was really struck by this editorial written in um, 1990, which really, just before I was doing this, um, and was kind of captured what was going on here around um, CNMs feeling uh, belittled or unappreciated, hurt, angry, some viewing that real midwifery could only happen outside of the hospital um, in freestanding birth centers or at home. Uh, there was some language about nurse midwives doing med or being med midwives and not doing uh, midwifery. That was had such a stronghold and really was, I thought, a pretty big barrier in terms of their sense of um, solidarity. I spent a lot of time talking about that um, in my work. And I found it actually a little ironic um, just in terms of what the early OBs were saying in 1915 and kind of what they were saying a century later um, to me that midwifery care can happen and does happen in all settings. The issue is actually medicine and the stronghold um, that it has. So I really pushed, I tried to push a little hard on them about that particular um, issue. So again, you'll see here, see things like medwives and the culture in the hospital, um, nurse midwives rightfully saying that they want to go where the women are because that's where the vast majority of people who are seeking midwifery care um, go. But that is also a story of um, insurance and all kinds of things that isn't just about people don't want to birth at home, which is a very common narrative that um, happens in midwifery and it's just not, this is not accurate. Um, so that was a big, a big theme. I'm glad to say that we have sort of moved past that. That's very exciting to me. Um, I'm always really interested in how media impacts what people say and how they interpret things. So that movie, The Help, was very big at the time when I was doing this um, research, which was about um, fictionalized account of Eugenia Skeeter. I think it was in Mississippi. She comes home and she... Um, basically does this interview project with some of the black maids in the um, town, including one who worked for um, her family. And 
when I was asking Black midwives about why they viewed um, the relatively low percentage of Black people birthing with Black midwives, they talked a lot about cultural imagery and these controlling images of Black women. Um, the controlling images is something that comes from Black feminist thought, Patricia Hill Collins, and the Mammy is just one of them. There are, there are others, but it was very significant at the time. They were talking about um, media images of Black midwives specifically as being subservient and kind of benevolent. And cultural imagery is so, so incredibly strong. Um, and interestingly enough, when I was doing this, I didn't know it was going to happen at the time, but I was doing research right during the big um, resignation from MANA that happened in 2012 when um, six, six or maybe nine um, midwives of color resigned from MANA citing institutional racism. And they also referenced the help in their letter. So it's both of these things were happening at the same time. And that was a huge, huge, huge watershed um, moment. The controlling images still exist today. It's just that the help is now 10 years old and that's not the framework. They're still talking about controlling images. Um, and not just culturally, the same thing applies for how um, they thought white dominated midwifery viewed black midwives also. Only talking to black people when it was time for Black History Month and whatever, that stuff was very, very, very significant. Um, so you'll see a lot of language around um, mammy or angry black woman, which isn't actually the mammy one that's more like the Jezebel, the Sapphire, but those controlling images of blackness are really very, very significant and continue today. They just are slightly different. Um, Diversity and inclusion as performance art is one of my favorite things um, of the themes here. Um, and a lot of them talked about this episode from The Office. I'm not sure if people have seen it. It's actually really kind of funny, but um, because it's, meant, it's meant to be uncomfortable as it should. So the fictional Dunder Mifflin, the um, Michael, the, the guy, I forget what his role was, but whatever, he organizes this uh, diversity day and people are supposed to put, he hands out index cards and you put the index card on your forehead and you don't know what's on your forehead and people have to basically say terribly racist, sexist, classist things in order for you to guess what's on your forehead. And, and when I was asking midwives about the beginning at the time, it was very new, the beginning of this language around diversity and inclusion, they often referenced um, the office. And they, the point there is that they viewed it as kind of a joke, um, that it wasn't taken as seriously, largely because people were unwilling to say racism and whiteness and white supremacy. So a lot of like celebration, popping champagne, performance art for white people and saying things like, ah, it makes me wanna scream because it's funny, but it also was very painful and um, harmful to them. So disingenuous and performative and speaking specifically to a failure to attend to anti-blackness within um, midwifery. It's very easy to kind of lump BIPOC that I struggle with that term. They really struggle with that term too. It's so important to pay attention to the specificity of anti-blackness because um, the experiences are fundamentally different. Um, you'll see here, people are not willing to name uh, structural racism. Addressing issues of black faculty, which we saw that in terms of program directors, there's been some huge gains um, there too, but just as concordant care matters in birth, concordant care also matters around seeing someone that looks like you. Um, I'm the only black person in uh, my faculty that's very common, um, but that is a structural, uh, structural issue and it absolutely impacts who um, who completes midwifery school, who stays in midwifery school. This issue of preceptors, um, people needing someone to get their clinical practice and training, that is still a major issue. And that is a huge area for funders. Schools have not been able to manage that well. Um, people having to leave homes um, and leave family in order to move across the country to get their clinical skills training. Um, black students reporting overwhelmingly that um, sometimes white midwives saying things like their clients may not feel comfortable. It's a very common thing, still exists today. There is so much work to do to build a structure 
for preceptorships that doesn't depend on individuals navigating that. It's terrible and it's very abusive from my perspective. Um, and naming racism as a revolutionary act. That was huge in 2012, 2013. I'm glad we have made some gains um, there, but it was sort of taboo even at the time to say whiteness or white supremacy. Um, phase uh, two, the part C here, big things that have happened. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm just rushing a little bit because I want to make sure that I leave um, time for questions. Big things that have happened, uh, Black Lives Matter as a movement happened. Um, there has been, I would say, less significant attention to birth justice within the Black Lives Matter movement. I have tried some gains there. There are a number of us have tried some gains. I think that is um, shifting, but Black birth is really, I think, sort of the foundation of the mattering. We should really start there as a point of um, entry in terms of the national understanding of Black Lives Matter. Returning to these three people here, um, Mary Lawler I met in 2012, actually at one of the last um, summits that ICTC was having. And I was presenting some preliminary research. Um, again, Mary, she's now resigned, but she was the founding executive director of NACPM. She, um, we kept in contact, we exchanged contact information. I adored her within the first five minutes, mostly because I was super impressed with the questions that she asked and the fact that she was there. Um, NACPM, I think at the time, really did, um, really did call to the moment in what was emerging in 2012. Um, and so we exchanged information. She told me that we would be in uh, contact. Then we fast forward uh, three years later, we did stay in contact um, and they changed the bylaws to allow for a public member to join the board in NACPM. So I joined in 2015 as the first public member, which is really significant. Um, in the midwifery community, I was the first non-midwife to be on a board, but really um, it's so important, um, not just for um, having sort of a different perspective or having a researcher specifically, but there's something in there about accountability and a culture of inquiry that all, all organizations really can benefit from. So I'll always have all the respect for Mary um, from that big leader and visionary there. I've been able to do lots of really interesting things. A lot has happened in those years. Um, the things I will say is that things like um, scholarships, which was the essence of the Bigger Table Initiative and helping with mentorship programs, um, helping with funding for state exams, those were efforts that we did to address some of the things that emerged in my study, Nancy Anderson's study. There have been just a few. The, but those we should understand are a bit of like patchwork things to address much larger issues. There was a lot of internal work that was going on um, at NACPM with um, white leaders doing some work around investigating white supremacy, anti-blackness, having some very difficult conversations. Um, those board meetings got really interesting, but that is essential, absolutely essential to the work. So been able to do some interesting things. I can answer any questions about them. What's significant now is that um, Mary resigned in October, 2021. And so um, my relationship with philanthropy changed a bit because um, we primarily got our funding from individual donors and those were all relationship-based from Mary. And so when she resigned, we were in a new place of making relationships with foundations to share the work of NACPM. I learned a lot about um, midwifery philanthropy in the last year and a half um, from that experience. So I'm speaking as a researcher but also speaking as someone writing grants for NACPM um, to build a strong organizational growth and sustainability. Because while the BIPOC and LGBTQIA organizations have really risen in the most powerful ways, and NACPM, to be fair, is predominantly uh, also Black led, it's just not necessarily viewed um, that way. But professional associations must be strong in order to advance midwifery. It must, they have to advance their scope of 
practice and so on. So I really want to, again, support the advancement of ACNM and NACPM to build a really robust infrastructure. And philanthropy has a really important part there. Um, and we are also searching for a new executive director and also learned a lot of things about philanthropy uh, from that process. Um, I mentioned that COVID has had a significant impact. That's a big thing that has um, happened and that's Kiki Jordan, the president of NACPM. So today, things that sort of new themes. One is we have moved past uh, the issue of kind of naming uh, racism, but this is one of my favorite uh, quotes here when I ask people around what's changed. Uh, Black solidarity happened, this was in 2020. Your dissertation happened, Black Lives Matter happened, talking about the movement, National Black Midwives Alliance, which was started in 2018. And by the way, in 2018 was a big year. Black Mamas Matter, uh, National Black Midwives Alliance, uh, Queer and Trans Association, and the National Association to Advance Black Birth, all 2018, uh, which is mad here. Um, 1619, and a lot of what they're saying is pushing back a lot of Black solidarity and ascension, very different than the kind of internal divisions around who was doing real midwifery. I'm very glad we have moved past that. What I was curious about is um, how white midwives in particular were um, doing their own work around anti-racism and equity. And one of the big ones was Robin DiAngelo's uh, White Fragility, which I have all kinds of thoughts on and that maybe for a different conversation. But what is really fascinating to me is about the way that um, black midwives viewed white midwives doing this work and they framed it as kind of a spiritual uh, process and they don't mean that in the kindest of ways. So I'll read um, some of these. And to be clear, the steps that they come up with, I think these are fascinating, is uh, confession, uh, like exorcism or purging, and then this baptism. It's like, oh, I'm going to confess my sins, and then I emerge as someone uh, new. So the, the confession sage um, labeling is like a weird cult, that it has a big money, which it does, the anti-racism industrial complex here. This community confession, they'll take any opportunity to talk about being anti-racist or an ally instead of just doing it. Um, the things around social media, the t-shirts, the buttons, you know, I'm a good person, but it's part of their, I am a, I, I am an ally process and guilt. Guilt, the proliferation of white guilt as in contrast to white action is a major, major theme. And guilt is not helpful and it's not instructive. Um, guilt and like confessing their first stage is where they get stuck. It's the equivalent to me of thoughts and prayers after a casualty terms of action, seeding power, and leveraging resources, that guilt shit, excuse me, is unproductive. Um, baptism and uh, exorcism and baptism, they thought that exorcism was kind of the second phase, but the exorcism is more about, um, it's really interesting the way they phrase it, like a purging of whiteness. So it's kind of the antidote to the revival of midwifery in the 1960s and 70s. Also not helpful. We should just tell the truth, the robust truth about midwifery. So the purging, they're talking about the big 2012. It's all those big events that happened. Um, Donald Trump, we cannot um, underestimate the significance of him and 2020 and white guilt. What's interesting about the way that they frame this in terms of, because it's a developmental process in the way that they think about it, but that the vast majority of it stays at the first stage, the confession. And they talk a lot about, um, they use the analogy of like, um, I didn't grow up Catholic, but I went to Catholic schools and going to um, confession. And um, that that is sort of where it stopped. And that's not always the most useful. You got to do something after that. And they talk about, being the proverbial clergy where needing for white women in particular, needing to have some audience to talk about their whiteness and black midwives and all midwives are color. It's like, no, don't do that. Just do, do the work, do the work. Um, and this idea of a baptism kind of emerging new spiritual unlearning or something and it's bodily racism is violent. I just cannot trust it because I've seen the show of I am good and I am safe before not that different than how they framed um, diversity and inclusion performance art with the office um, years ago. Um, this is one of my favorites about 
this baptism thing because they are not saying this uh, in a friendly way. So 55% of white women, that number is a little off, but they're talking about um, Donald Trump or Alicia here is. The same white liberals crying and we're free crying and saying, sorry for being racist, crying at the Women's March. Yeah, yeah, I'm your ally. But when push comes to shove, your allegiance is to your whiteness and or policies and practices that directly harm me, the very person that you are crying to. A number of them, again, cultural imagery is fascinating, referenced this um, photo. I'm sure people have seen this from the Women's March after Trump was elected. You see the stark contrast between the cute pink pussy hats here and this black woman here with the lollipop and it says stop killing black people on um her cap and she says don't forget white women voted for trump so there's a huge sort of disconnect here but this midwifery is nothing more again than a microchasm of what is happening in the united states there's a lot of work to do in terms of building trust that extends far beyond what they think are performative kinds of things happening Another key, key, huge, I cannot stress enough, and funders have such an important place here, is we have to think about equity intersectionally. Um, even NACPM had to do a lot of that work too, that it is not just about racism, it is disability, it is ageism, it is also uh, cis heteropatriarchy, and this idea of queering midwifery is essential. Two big things happened in 2015 that um, haven't received the same kinds of attention, frankly, as what happened with the great resignation in 2012, which is about an open letter written to um, MANA after they changed some of the uh, cultural competency standards to um, be more gender inclusive. And so there was a big letter that was written with over 200 signatures across all credentials um, about attempts at inclusive inclusivity, denying material biological reality and further disconnect ourselves from nature and the body. And they called for a revision of the 2014 standards. So when they went to language like birthing people um, or women and birthing people, the, the battle over the word woman was is and still very strong, but that is really an issue of patriarchy, which doesn't, and whiteness that needs to be expanded here. Both things can and do exist at the same time and not all people birthing are women. And that is a big piece for midwifery to tackle with, especially amongst um, black midwives. The, dis the issues around history and all that is, um, is less salient. This issue is one of the biggest things that is coming up in my research this time and is quite challenging to talk about. Um, I love, this was written by um, actually one of the co-founders for the National Black Midwives Alliance, Jamar Amani. I'm not going to read all of it, but it may really packs the punch around the work to be done around queering midwifery. And I mean that in every way around people who are birthing. It is about queer midwives. It is about thinking about different possibilities in midwifery. Um, the things I think are most significant here, every person and family who seeks it, regardless of race, ethnicity, religion, ability, sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression, we acknowledge the disproportionate effects of transphobia on those with other marginalized identities, when you think intersectionally, such as being a person of color, low income, or disabled. Many racial health disparities that concern midwives and impact our communities are experienced in greater numbers by people who are both Black and transgender. I think the statistics is Black trans women life expectancy is 35. Um, these, life, these, li these lives, especially our need of kind of respectful, compassionate, and individualized care midwives can offer. We assert that we can honor the power of the female body and at the same time extend this reverence to all people who are pregnant and give birth, and that to do so is in full alignment with the heart of midwifery. Um, where I get to the funders um, piece is that my uh, my mother passed away in 2016 um, after I maybe about two years after I finished my doctorate and she um, was diagnosed with cancer maybe a week after I we had the ceremony and I've written publicly and speak very publicly about how significant her death was to me but also how I viewed and understood midwifery because a lot of um, not just black midwives, but midwives just in general were wonderful to me throughout that. And midwifery has much greater capacity outside of birth and pregnancy, also in relationship to death and dying, which we do not talk enough about. And I've never given birth, but I can speak very 
personally about how wonderful they were to me then. But I started an award in my mom's name, actually at Jenny Joseph School in, um, in Florida. And again, she's the first um, black woman to own a uh, accredited midwifery school in the country. But what is significant, at least to me about it is I knew I wanted to do it at Jenny School. I knew I wanted to do something in my mom's name. She was an educator for 40 years and I couldn't figure out what I wanted to do. So I contacted one of my dear friends and mentors, Monica um, McLemore, who I'm sure we all know, to some degree. She's at, uh, now she's at Washington State. And this is a piece that she's published in 2022, but I was working on this in 2020. And I asked her if she could help me think through the award. I knew that I wanted to give discretionary funds to a black midwife to do whatever they wanted to do with it in their last year whether that would help them with preceptors or do something for themselves or whatever the case may be. And Monica said, well, you should just understand really what this is, that this is, um, you know, essentially kind of a retrofit, which I love the language here, that there are kind of three areas here. There's, you can retrofit things, you can reform things, and you can reimagine things. And we really want to get to the reimagining, but actually we need all of these things to happen at the same time. So I understood that the scholarship was a, a retrofit. She also helped me to think through, um, it's not that there are no strings attached, but that it is discretionary and trusting people to do whatever it is they want to do with the money. So I, I could also talk, if that's helpful, about the application procedures and whatever. But the only condition for me is that they pay it forward. And I have a list of things that they can do, and I will help them and support them in that. That I think was working on that with Monica in 2012 was the kind of the first time I really started to think more significantly about the role of philanthropy, even though this is just me sort of personally um, doing this. But also, um, it also started to come up in the interviews. This was a little bit before I started interviewing again. And again, because Black midwives have started to emerge as such strong leaders, they're leading national organizations, they are researchers, they are grant makers and all kinds of things themselves the role of philanthropy really started to come up because people are moving in a more macro um, way. And so here's my big sort of pitch around the role of philanthropy. That philanthropy is kind of no different than the medical industrial complex, the diversity industrial complex, that it really sits at all of these intersections in a really powerful way to inform laws, power, knowledge, norms, economics, and so on. And the thing that I have learned from my own experience, grant writing, NACPM, forming this thing in my mom's name, but also doing all this research over the years, that the role of philanthropy is so significant because it's private assets for public good. And the public good is because it really is a failure of the United States to do very basic things like social determinants of health. So philanthropy has such an important role to address those things. Philanthropy can address the, can't really address all the issues around the social determinants of health, but two, three, and four, I think are most significant. One is about research justice, and I am saying this partially as a researcher, but there's something really important to be said around who we understand to be experts and knowledge bearers. Um, we are very credential um, obsessed. Again, ironic, I'm showing up with a doctorate, but that's what happens. People ask me to do things because I have a doctorate. When it actually, I, yes, there are ways in which I'm an expert, but we should be investing in community-based organizations and midwives themselves. They also do research. They need to be empowered to do research. We do not have a national arm to support Black midwifery research. That again informs the workforce analysis that is needed, so many national things that are required. And so research justice is more about what kinds of methodologies, how do you dismantle credentialism, how do you dismantle these really sharp, arbitrary, disciplinary boundaries. Investing in robust research is an important way for um, philanthropy to move forward. Philanthropy also informs legislation and policy in terms of, again, the, the, the thing that I did in my mother's name, just the application procedures alone. I'm so grateful for, for Monica in terms of thinking through less cumbersome application procedures, the frequency of awards, the distribution of them even. I was going to give the money at the beginning of, the, of this uh, education pro process for Black midwives. 
And actually Jenny and Monica and Black Midwives said, no, it's, it's helpful, but not helpful at the beginning. It's actually helpful at the end. Had I not asked the question or done the research, I may not have been as helpful as I need it to be. Um, and reporting procedures, there is a really important way to make that less cumbersome. And that has such an important influence on legislators and policies, how they also do funding priorities and goals and procedures. It's like philanthropy has to do that own kind of um, work. So I'm so grateful for Betsy and all the work that is being done. And in the sociocultural imagination, we don't spend a whole lot of time um, on this, but media representations, visual representations of um, midwifery are just as important. Really investing in the arts and um, artistic ways of viewing midwifery that don't come out of uh, packaged Hollywood productions of what midwives are. Um, there are some artists and documentarians that are also midwives who are in this sample who talk a lot about the significance of art um, to advancing midwifery. And that is to me a really important area for philanthropy. So I'll end um, here in that one of uh, my favorite midwives talks about what justice is, is that justice is telling the truth, being accountable for it. Those two things must be required in order to get to justice. Telling the truth is about the role of whiteness, patriarchy, cis heteropatriarchy, all of those things, being accountable for it and moving towards justice. Philanthropy has the opportunity to build the strong coalitions that are needed amongst professional associations, amongst midwives um, themselves in these, what I imagine these four areas, direct service provision, education um, in so many areas, Legislation and policy, of course, um, like for example, NACPM hasn't had a lobbyist in many, many years. That has a major impact on CPM policy in this country. They need to be in the Social Security Act to impact um, Medicaid recipients, to impact insurance. There are so many key areas here. And as I have mentioned um, in terms of research, I have so many ideas for each of these areas that I could do a whole nother presentation on. But it must be done with some core values, which are actually not mine. These are things that come from the research that use the same values from midwifery and apply them here, that they should be person-centered and relationship-based. So building relationships with um, people that you are funding and also not reaching out solely for uh, you know, the PhDs and, and all of that, the people who are doing the work on a day-to-day -day basis, building those relationships with them is essential. I think there's a way in which people like me can be helpful in having a, a bit of a pulse on what people are doing, but really that is not my day-to-day -day and the direct service care provider, there must be investment in them and relationships um, with them. Um, there's a distinction between, you know, trust and trustworthiness. My mom used to say you have to be trustworthy to develop trust. You got to be trustworthy. And there's a big disconnect in trust um, between not just Black midwives, but midwives of color and philanthropy. Also the take ideas, of taking ideas and things. Um, a culture of inquiry and assessment, NACPM to allow for a public member required a culture of inquiry and philanthropy must do the same thing. Culture of inquiry and assessment around the own internal equity assessment, what you are funding, how you are funding, the frequency of those funding, how are you intersecting with other, um, other justice movements, particularly disability and climate change um, and LGBTQIA, which are deeply, deeply connected to um, deeply connected to blackness. This again, this slide alone, I could do a whole nother uh, hour on. I'd be happy to do some time. Um, so I will end there just to if anybody has questions. I know we are running a little over. My email is here if anybody wants to follow up by email. I'm gonna stop my share. Okay, wow, Keisha. We we do have a um a practice of ending right on time. I could not interrupt you. That was so amazing. So thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm happy to come back anytime. That that would be great. That does mean we don't have time for questions. I saw um uh Stephanie uh, posted a great question that I think I'd like to follow up on maybe with a webinar about the tension between the different licensures with midwives. Yeah, that's a whole nother. Right. Away. 
Right. So um, thank you, everybody, uh, for being here. But most of all, thank you, Keisha. That was incredible. Yeah, thank you for and having me. yeah, it was just great to hear from you and and learn these quotes from these from the midwives are powerful. Yeah. yeah. So thank you all. Thank you. I, appreciate it. I hope to see you again. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye.